Good morning. We want to welcome you to the service this morning. Uh, those of you watching online, we uh, certainly encourage you to engage with us in the worship this morning, along with those that are gathered here in person this morning. We're blessed to be together, and uh, we just want to take the opportunity to thank the Lord uh, for all of his many blessings and also to uh, uh, just, we just welcome the opportunity to be together and to worship as we can under these uh, trying circumstances. Uh, so once again, uh, welcome, and we're gonna, I'm going to have a word of prayer. We're going to turn it over to the ladies, and we're going to uh, worship together in spirit and in truth. Father, we praise you and we thank you for just a wonderful, wonderful day and the opportunity to worship together. We just pray, Father, that you would just bless this time. We praise you and thank you that you have left us with, with the instructions that as uh, spiritual beings, as having experienced the new birth in Christ, that we can come together and worship uh, in uh, worship you in in that manner, in spirit and in truth. And so I just pray that you be with us as we sing the songs this morning. Pray that you would be with us as we go to your word and allow you to speak to our hearts this morning. And that in everything we honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you all stand with us this morning as we sing?
uh, over the next few weeks, I want us to begin to examine uh, one of the things that I think is significant. We don't really spend a lot of time talking about this as far as messages go, uh, but it's the the teaching that Jesus, or the, the phrase that Jesus uses in, in, in the Gospels, or the Gospel writers use in reference to some of Jesus' teaching and preaching in the Gospels, and that is this concept or this idea of the kingdom of God, or as in, as we see mostly in the, in the book of in the book of Matthew, of the kingdom of heaven. And so I want us to kind of explore what this is about when Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. What what is involved? Well, what is behind this this instruction with regard to the kingdom of God? We we have the understanding that the kingdom of God has to do with the church. But do we really understand the, the full import of this teaching? What the kingdom of God looks like, what it is for our lives. And, and so I want us to explore this over a few weeks. Uh, and one of the best ways to begin this is to understand that with regard to the kingdom of God, Jesus actually gives us a Magna Carta. And that Magna Carta of the kingdom of God is the Sermon on the Mount. And that, that Sermon on the Mount, Christians, as Christians, as those came to know Christ as Lord and Savior, uh, there in the book of Acts, they, they began to understand the teachings, the instruction of Jesus, and so they began to live their lives by that Magna Carta, that Sermon on the Mount. And so we want to explore uh, this idea of the kingdom of God, this teaching of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and we want to explore not only through the uh, the Sermon on the Mount, but also to look at it with respect to what the Old Testament has to say about this information that will come about, this new covenant that Jesus is going to establish, this new relationship, this new kingdom of rule that he's going to establish. It's interesting when you when you read how Christians live in the first century. You get, a, you get a grasp of that when you go back and you look at some of the writings of some of the uh, first century uh, pagan individuals or secular individuals and what they had to say about this, this life that Christians live. And so after, the word of prayer, after we read scripture and after a word of prayer, I want to read to you a, a very brief letter written by a man by the name of Diogenes. And it's a second century letter that describes Christians and how that they live in that day and time. Let's, let's look to scripture this morning. We're going to look at uh, Matthew's Gospel chapter 4. Use this as our text as we introduce this and, and just see that this, this was the focus of Jesus' ministry was the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Matthew 4 beginning with verse 12 it says, When he heard that John had been arrested... He withdrew into Galilee. He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, along the road by the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who live in darkness have seen a great light. And for those living in the shadow of the land of death, a light has dawned. From then on, and notice this verse, verse 17. From then on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. And then if you skip on down to verse 23 of that same chapter, it says, Now Jesus began to go all, go all over Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Now, what I, what I want us to see is when he's talking about the kingdom and the healing, they're, they're connected. There's a relationship there when it talks about that. Because the kingdom of God is, inaug is being inaugurated and will find its full inauguration when Jesus defeats sin and death on the cross. But it will be consummated when, when the, uh, God's original creation is restored, and we see that in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 21, it talks about how that there will be no more suffering, no more tears, no more death. Jesus is introducing to us the characteristics of the kingdom. 
When he goes and does these healings, it's connected to the relationship or it's connected to the kingdom of God. This is what life's going to look like in the kingdom. People are not going to be lame. They're not going to be deaf. Or deaf. They're, they're not going to be, they're, they're not going to die. This is going to be an eternal kingdom that's established. Let's pray. Father, we praise you and we thank you that we have been able to, uh, uh, to just come to this time of worship and now to open your word and begin to digest some of the, the, some of the teaching with regard to your, your coming kingdom, the consummation of your kingdom. And so it is, Father, that we just lift up this time to you, allow your word to speak to us in every aspect. These things we just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the second century, Diogenes just wrote this letter describing a strange people who are in the world but not of the world, it says, basically. And he says Christians are not differentiated from other people by country, language, or customs. You see, they do not live in cities of their own or speak some strange dialect. They live in both Greek and foreign cities wherever chance has put them. They follow local customs in clothing, food, and the other aspects of life. But at the same time, they demonstrate to us the unusual form of their own citizenship. They live in their own native lands, but as aliens. Every foreign country is to them as their native country. They marry and have children just like everyone else, but they do not kill unwanted children or unwanted babies. They offer a shared table, but not a shared bed. They are passing their days on earth, but are citizens of heaven. They obey the appointed laws in their own lives, they love everyone but are persecuted by all. They are put to death and gain life. They are poor and yet make, every, make many rich. They are dishonored and yet gain glory through dishonor. Their names are blackened and yet they are clear. They are mocked and blessed in return. They are treated outrageously and behave respectfully to others when they do good they are punished. They rejoice as if being given new life. They are attacked by Jews as aliens and are persecuted by Greeks. Yet those who hate them cannot give any reason for their hostility. Nearly 2,000 years ago, that writer captured in words what he was witnessing firsthand. And that, my friends, is the people of God living out the Sermon on the Mount, the people of God living the kingdom, living within the kingdom of God. And Jesus began his ministry, the Bible says, as we read earlier, that he traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The concept of the kingdom of God was central to the teaching of Jesus. And therefore, as I said previously, it should be serious in our efforts, or we should be serious in our efforts to understand what Jesus' teachings about the kingdom were as they pertain to the kingdom of God or to the kingdom of heaven. E. Stanley Jones defines the kingdom of God like this. He says, the kingdom of God is God's total order, expressed as realm and reign in the individual and in society and which is to replace the present unworkable world order with God's order in the individual and in society. And while the nature of the kingdom is social, the entrance into it is by a personal new birth now. The character of that kingdom is seen in the character of Jesus. The kingdom of God is Christ-likeness. The same rule which is in heaven, and because it is Christ-likeness, this makes it heaven. We experience a scent or a taste of heaven here upon this earth being within the kingdom of God, there and here. And while it is a total order demanding total obedience, it brings total freedom. In Luke 11, Jesus' disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Teach us to put things the way that they should be. 
And Jesus said, pray like this. Not pray these words, but pray like this. And then in Matthew, it gives us the more detailed account of that. Where Matthew says we should pray, or where Jesus says in Matthew, or Matthew records it, we should pray, Our Father which is in heaven. And then it talks about your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We have within us, an ex we have within us an, an experience with regard to the kingdom of God. And the purpose of God, when you back all of this up to Genesis, the purpose of God in creating the world was to establish his reign over all the earth. And that reign was marred and spoiled by disobedience of mankind in the Garden of Eden. Christ came to reclaim that which was his own and to proclaim God's rule and reign over all the earth through his Jesus, through his victory as he overcame the cross and arose from the grave. He proclaimed that his complete victory would come at the time he returned to earth. Listen to these words, Paul writes, When every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The kingdoms of this world go blindly on. They believe that their power and their glory is the only thing that counts in this world. They don't see that there is an eternal hand working behind the scenes which determines the destiny and the fate of every individual and nation. And yet the psalmist assures us, the Lord reigns, let the earth be glad. God is the ruler yet. We even sing that old hymn. This is my father's world, oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems all so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world, the battle is not done. Jesus who died and shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one. Earth and heaven collide to be one. God will restore his original creation as we see in the book of Revelation. Knew of the coming of a new heaven and a new earth. And basically what that psalm says, what the psalmist is saying about all of this is it, it, it comes down or boils down to this. In other words, chill out. God's in control. Julian of Norwich wrote, All is well, and all manner of things will be well. But the question boils down to us here this morning, you watching online is this how does this affect me how does this affect us as we consider the kingdom of god there are four major truths that we need to understand and we're going to examine the first two this week to begin with the reality of the kingdom of god affects us in two ways individually and globally and the first point i wish to make is this is that the kingdom of God changes us individually. The problem with the people of Jesus' day was that they supposed that Messiah's kingdom would only be national in scope. It would be political in nature, and it would transform their nation into a world power again. They would no longer be under the oppression of Rome. As a matter of fact, they would be in control of the world they would be in control of their destiny they would be once again god's people and god would be with them and israel looked to that day when there would be no king but god they lived in a holy land that was trampled and polluted by the pagans and they looked forward to the day when it would be cleansed so that israel could again live in communion with the lord the nation would be liberated from its bondage to these pagan oppressors, just as it had been delivered from Egypt and Babylon. God would return to the temple and would once again dwell among his people. The fact is, they're not much different than people of the world today. 
There are those of the world today that think that the kingdom of God will come when the right person is in power, regardless of what country you live in. They are those who think that the kingdom of God will come when one who, who, who is in power that is closest to your views of leadership and who carries out the things that are most important to the nation. You see, throughout the world, we put our confidence and our hope in individuals. We put our confidence and our hope, and I speak this worldwide, but, it, but to us as individuals here as well, is that we put our confidence and our hope in political leaders as much as they did, as they did in the religious leaders of their day, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and then to look for a Messiah that would come. And it was even, even recorded, as you look at John's Gospel, the sixth chapter, whereby that the people wanted to force Jesus to become king. And so we place our confidence in a person. We place our, or in people. We place our confidence in military power, in the nation state, rather than placing our confidence in God and the power of reaching out in his name to change a disenfranchised world. I believe, with all my heart, I, I'm convinced that the answer to the problems of our world today, our nation today, or any nation, lie in the repentance and the transformed lives of that nation's people. And when our loyalties to the nation's state come before our loyalty to the kingdom of God and the people of the kingdom, then we know for sure that our confidence has been misplaced. Can you imagine the Christians of the early church placing their hope in the Roman Empire? Do you, can, do, you, do you think they dreamed of having, of one day raising up a Caesar, a Christian Caesar, laws based on, on scripture, on the Torah and political leaders, or in the case of Christians, laws based upon the, the teaching of the apostles and political leaders who based their decisions on the teachings of Jesus? That would have been a laughable matter in, in their day and time. They saw themselves as a light unto the world. We're the influence. Not the, not the leaders of the world, but we as Christians are the influence. And they, were, they saw themselves as being a kingdom within a kingdom. The problem for them in their day and time was surviving persecution at the hands of government. And not being the next meal for hungry lions. And Jesus' disciples fled. When he was arrested because they assumed in the early moments uh, of Jesus uh, or in the early hours of Jesus after his crucifixion and before they knew or aware of his resurrection, they fled assuming that they would be crucified along with him as well. You see, they didn't put their hope in Rome. And they didn't put their hope in that Rome getting the eventual picture and becoming a great Christian empire. Their hope was in God, who was transforming the world one person at a time. Their hope was in the fact that they had a living Savior and that the power of the resurrection and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit was available to them. They knew their experience with God had transformed their lives and they believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that it could transform the lives of others. The Bible says, once having been asked by the Pharisees in Luke's gospel, Jesus says, once having been asked, or Luke records, once having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied with these world, words. He said, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is. Because the kingdom of God is, you know, what's he say? Within you. The kingdom is not in the nations of the world. The kingdom is not in the kingdoms of the world. Within you resides the power of the universe. You and I as Christians have the kingdom of God within us. Now how does this happen? It happens when we accept God's invitation to be a part of his kingdom. Jesus declared, he says, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Just as you've had a physical birth, there must be a spiritual birth. 
We become subjects of a kingdom within a kingdom. We are a part of the kingdom of this world, but our allegiance is to another kingdom. Mother Teresa once said, by blood and origin, I am all Albanian. My citizenship is Indian. As to my calling, I belong to the whole world. As to my heart, I belong entirely to Jesus. As Christians, that should be our banner. I belong entirely to Jesus. The kingdom of God changes us individually. But the kingdom of God changes the world. The kingdom which we are a part of is not just for our private enjoyment. Neither can the church just become a little holy club where we insulate ourselves and become separate from the world. This is too big to be kept to ourselves. This is too grand an idea, a teaching to be kept to ourselves. It is not just about you and Jesus. You see, it's about the kingdom. And it's about how I relate within the kingdom and how the kingdom affects, affects me as it's within me. Because the kingdom goes against all, uh, all against, it goes against the radical individualism of our culture. When you belong to Christ, you become a person of the world. You become a part of a larger community. You're here to make a difference in the world. Catch that. We are here to make a difference in the world. It's the responsibility of Christians to change the lives of individuals within the world. And that is by living out the message of the gospel of Christ. Notice that Paul, Paul writes in the book of Acts and he talks about how that lives were changed right there in Rome as he was in prison. The Christians at Rome greet you as do some of Caesar's household. They were converted. Those within the guards, among the guards that, that had imprisoned him or that held him captive, they were converted as well. And he writes these words in 2 Corinthians 5 about this this ministry that we have as Christians. All this is from God, he said, who reconciled us, who redeemed us, who made it all right, who corrected him, and he balanced the books. And all of this is to help himself, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Paul says we have been given the ministry and the message of reconciliation. The good news of the kingdom of God. Now, I'm going to tell you, it's frightening to realize that God's plan is to reconcile the world to himself. And to use us to bring about that reconciliation. But what could be a greater honor? What could be a greater privilege than for God to say, I am entrusting you with this sovereignty over this message of this good news of the kingdom of God, that you are to take this message to individuals with respect to God's kingdom in this world. My friends, there's hopelessness in the world. There's injustice in our world. And if you just keep your life to yourself, you'll never have a part in bringing Christ's kingdom here on earth. And the Great Commission goes out with the bathwater. You're not to see yourself as separate from the world. But very much a part of it. And very much having a real responsibility to make this world God's world. To prepare lives all around us of every walk for the coming kingdom. For the consummation when Jesus comes again. When God reigns and rules in our lives, we want to share what he's done for us. And we want to bring that same good news to a world which is living in confusion and despair. To a world that is in the depravity of sin. Never in the New Testament do we see individual Christians operating separately from the church. Always we see Christians working together for the purpose of bringing the world to Christ. In the second chapter of the book of Acts, we see them selling everything they own in order to provide for the needs of others. They pool their resources. They don't even consider their resources to be their own. 
They consider that they don't even own anything, that God is the ruler, yet God owns it all. God is sovereign over all things. He's made us, he's given us some measure of sovereignty in that we are stewards over what he has created. And their relationship with each other in the book of Acts, it, just, it set, talks about this, that they took on a new importance. As well as their responsibility toward the world. They are ministering to the poor and they are proclaiming the good news to the outcast. There was an English visitor that recently commented about U.S. churches. He said, you Americans are so concerned about being happy as if your kingdoms were the focal point of God's designs rather than God's kingdom being the focal point of yours. When we begin to focus on the kingdom of God, we begin to focus on the world. When you begin to realize that, that it is about this reclaiming, this restoration of God's kingdom, you begin to realize your role. It's not just about our personal faith. It's about being a community of faith, which is faithful to God and reaching out to a lost and dying world, a world that is essentially a world that is in the depravity of sin, a world that is in darkness, a world that is lost without Jesus. I want to close with these words as the ladies come up from Albert Schweitzer. I want you to listen carefully to what he said with regard to the kingdom of God and the kingdom with regard to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. He says, there can be no kingdom of God in the world without the kingdom of God in our hearts. Now let me repeat that again. There can be no kingdom of God in the world without the kingdom of God in our hearts. The world will change when our lives are changed. Our communities will change. When our lives will change. Our nation will change when our lives are changed as individuals. When we live within the kingdom, within a kingdom. When we resign that I am going to live all out for the kingdom of God. I am going to live all out the teachings of Jesus. Then we will see change. Let's bow for a word of prayer as we close, and then we're going to have our invitation. If you're outside of Christ this morning, we invite you to come and make that decision. If there's a need to just change in the way that you approach the kingdom of God, the way you live out your life in the kingdom, then that's a decision you can make as well. If you're watching online and there's a decision that you need to make this morning, then certainly feel free to contact us, and we'll be glad to walk you through the process of what it is to, be, uh, to become a Christian and to live in the kingdom of God, a kingdom within the kingdom. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we praise you and we thank you for your word, the challenge that you lay before us, and that in all things that we honor and glorify your word, and we will honor and glorify you through that word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's be standing for invitation.
Let me share a passage of scripture with you and some thoughts with regard to this communion time that we come to. Um, in talking about the kingdom of God, one of the things that was mentioned is the fact that we live within it. We live in a kingdom within a kingdom. And, and I think there are some words in Jeremiah, I believe, that, that relate to this relationship that we have within our world. We're not to be exclusive, but we're to continue on and strive to, to have an impact in the world. And Jeremiah writes, Jeremiah has a letter to the exiles, a word from God to the exiles. Uh, he says in Jeremiah 29, beginning with verse 4, says, This is what the Lord of armies the God of Israel says to all the exiles, I deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Find wives for yourselves and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give, daughters, give your daughters to men in marriage so that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there, do not decrease. Pursue the well-being of the city I have deported you to. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for when it thrives, you will thrive. Did you get those words? What he's saying is, and this was with regard to Israel, he said, be the Israelites that I called you to be. Change the people where you are. Even if you're in captivity, even though you're in exile at this moment, Change the lives of those people by living as the people of God. Our lives are, are to be an example in all that we do. And one of the things that we have that exemplifies our relationship with Christ is the privilege of sharing in the Lord's Supper. Uh, some might find that it's insignificant because it's just a little, little piece of wafer and a little cup of juice. But there's really great significance that surrounds this occasion. There's great symbolism about the relationship that we have with Jesus. In that that little piece of wafer represents the body of Jesus. The, the, the life of Jesus, the fact that he lived a life bodily on this earth. John says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That God became flesh and dwelt among us. Not only that, but he willingly went to the cross to die on our behalf. Inaugurating the kingdom of God. Putting an end to sin and death, redeeming mankind. And then there's the cup, the new covenant, the representation of the blood that was spilled on the cross. Throughout Scripture, we can't always explain why God chooses to use that medium, but throughout Scripture, he uses the meaning of blood in relation to the forgiveness of sin. There's so many, so many thoughts that, that, trans, that relate to that event. But it's, it's that representation of that sacrifice that brings to us a reminder of what Jesus done, what Jesus did to redeem us, to forgive our sin as we partake of the cup. Dear Wayne's going to come and he's going to lead us together as we partake of the loaf and the cup certainly have a word of prayer before that and so I encourage you at this time if you join us to have your communion ready online and for those of us here that we prepare ourselves as we partake together the loaf and the cup. body and we hold this cup. Our Father, as we come before thee in thy throne of grace, we thank thee that you deem us worthy because we ask what is man that you are mindful of him. Mere man that he come from the dirt 
and he's going to return to the dirt. But this soul is going to return to you to be judged. So as we partake of this body that feeds our spirit and our soul that you breathed into us to become a, a living soul, we feed our spirit with this body that, you, that was broken for us. And we drink this blood to cover our sins because love covers a multitude of sin. And Jesus Christ showed us that love on the cross of Calvary as he was crucified for the sins of the world. Dear God, my Father, he knew we were coming and he knew we were going to meet him. Dear God, my Father, we just thank you for this love because no greater love has no man than to lay down his life for his sins. And as we partake of this body and this blood, we're just thankful that Jesus Christ loved us enough to carry your will to the end. We ask that you'll forgive us of our sins. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Yesterday, I received some great news. My oldest grandchild, Ty, is going to be baptized today at 2 o'clock.
bow for a word of prayer. Father, we praise you and we thank you for this, this great occasion in which you allow us to worship together, an opportunity when, we, when our lives can just be blessed as uh, one uh, great body of believers. We're thankful for those who are Christian throughout the world, those who are, those, we just pray for those that are suffering great persecution beyond uh, the borders of this land that we know. We pray for those that are uh, just undergoing great trials with regard to sickness and illness. And we just pray that they, that you would uh, just touch the lives of Christians everywhere and strengthen them through the presence of your spirit and that through the power and the presence of your spirit that the message of the, the message of your kingdom, the good news, would be shared and that lives might be changed daily and added to your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week.